The rising power in the Ivy League is the Columbia Lions. Coach Megan Griffith is here to talk all about them. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. You are Locked on Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Megdahl, thanking you for making us your first listen every day. Women's basketball, six days a week. Every weekday, Saturday, we talk WNBA draft. Make sure you're subscribing wherever you get your podcasts or at YouTube. And obviously, it's not just me. It's the entire team over at The Next, thenexthoops.com, where we have over 100 reported pieces every single month. We have a dedicated Ivy League beat reporter in Jen Hatfield. We even have a second Ivy League reporter in Isabel Rodriguez, who is down in Princeton, a place I know you, Coach Megan Griffith, are familiar with. Uh, for both good and bad. And so let's get into it. First of all, welcome to uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, looking forward to it, Howard. I'm, I'm excited to talk hoops today. So do you have any residual feelings, emotions in favor of Princeton? For our audience, for those who don't know, um, you are obviously a Columbia alum, but you spent significant time with some of the best Princeton teams of all time before returning home. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of camaraderie and um, relationship building that was done there. And, you know, I would say like from jump, I was treated just like one of their own. And that's something I will never forget. And I'm extremely, you know, gracious that, you know, Courtney Banghart even hired me, right? Um, it was all kind of happened late. I was overseas and I was trying to get back. And I think I like applied on the last possible day. And um, Courtney was um, welcoming to me as well as the rest of their staff, Milena Flores, Melanie Moore. Melanie is now the head coach at Xavier. Um, so I was, it was a really special opportunity for me to one, be close to where I'm from home and also back in the Ivy league. Um, but you know, the, again, the people that I met there, the people I got to work with coach with, um, and the players I got to coach and build relationships with, um, I still talk to, to this day, you know, I've been in there, I've been at weddings of theirs. Um, you know, I have dinners with them in the city, so, you know, I learned, I learned a lot and I learned a lot about culture and winning and, you know, so it's, it's all love, but it's, it's also competitive and, you know, I'm, I'm one of the most competitive people that you'll meet. So they get that too. <laughs> it all makes sense. And again, competitive doesn't really begin to capture it. I know we were talking a little bit about this uh, before we came on the air, but you guys are perched at the precipice of what feels like a chance to come take over the Ivy League, you, you know, for, and, and we know well that Columbia has been, has had some good teams through the years, but there has been that duopoly for a long time up top. You know, Harvard's obviously been a consistent, you know, under Kathy Delaney Smith, who is now retired, which I can't even get my mind around, to be honest with you. And so as you think about the chance to not just win this lead, but to be a standard bearer. I wonder how important that is to you when you think about sort of the broad strokes of this Columbia program you've built. Well, it, you know, when I came back home, it wasn't just because I thought I could, I just wanted to be a head coach. You know, I, that it definitely wasn't that I, I would not have taken the job if I did not believe we had the resources to win the people to support us um, and, and the ability to recruit to a place. Right. So Columbia, you know, I don't think I would have went there if I didn't believe in it that much, but you know, I always, when I was a student athlete, I, I didn't really understand why we couldn't get it going. Right. And so, um, taking what I got to learn from the other side, um, and then getting this opportunity, I, it felt like the thing, like things had really lined up for me. And then the next piece was just making sure I hired the right people. And I did, I have an excellent staff. Um, and so, you know, again, like it's, it's something like I'm excited about. I'm excited that we are where we are right now. And, and my staff has worked tirelessly to get there. Our players have worked tirelessly, but you know, it's, it's, we're not trying to talk about like just the outcome of it all and really, you know, just enjoying the process with this group specifically. I have such an amazing team. Um, that's, that's, you know, people that I love and care about and we love to work hard together and compete, but I'm trying to keep them really focused on just like the details of every day and less about, Hey, 
in March, this is what we'll be doing. You know, we talk about it, but again, staying, staying daily focused, um, process oriented. You guys are not just daily focused, you're not just game focused, but you are possession focused. And if you'll forgive me, I like to dive into the into the weeds. I am a, a stat nerd, as our listeners know. Love and there, there is something that you guys do that I kind of would like to know both the philosophy and, and the process behind it. You are uh, extremely good in transition defense. You guys, uh, for Synergy, are upper sixth in the country in terms of points per possession given up. But the other thing that you do is no one's able to run on you. Um, and that's the bigger part. 14.2% of the time transition offense from the opponents. You guys are not a slow it down team. You guys are north of 20% yourselves. Just take me through, first of all, like how central that is to your philosophy. And second of all, how do you go about making sure that that is the way your team operates at that defensive end and preventing those transition opportunities? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's what's unique, right? Like you have to like, what are we good at? What are we, what are we doing? We want to play fast. It's very obvious. I think everybody knows that about us, but we also know with that comes a discipline because the minute you take a shot, the minute the ball leaves your hand, whether it's a turnover or a good decision or whatever it is, you have to already be thinking to the next thing. So we, we, we talk to our players about that a lot is what does that decision lead to, right? And it is a predictable shot or decision or is it something unpredictable? Because every time we can control a shot or decision or a look that we get, our team knows exactly where they need to be to start our defensive approach. So that's something we coach. We coach it in drills. We keep our we keep a very high pace, a fast pace in practice about getting from thing to thing. Um, but stopping the ball. So and also something we um, you know a term we use we call it tagging up. It's an Australian term, right? Like mm -hmm. we're creating a scrum around the basket. We know exactly who we're supposed to be matched up with as soon as a shot goes up. And with the versatility and athleticism that we have, it's been really successful for us because, you know, anybody one through five can pick up the primary ball handler knowing we're building a wall around that. Um, so, yeah. It, it makes sense. And again, it dovetails with the type of players that you consistently bring in. And I, I just I wonder how much versatility is at the top or near the top when you are looking at who is a Megan Griffith player here at Columbia. Yeah, it's, it's a really key component, Howard. You know, I think our staff understands um, when we were building our brand out, right? We knew where we wanted to go, and, and you know how it is. You have to get the personnel to do that. So we didn't take the approach of this is what we're going to do. This is the team we're going to be. It was more like, all right, what do we have right now in the cupboard, you know, when we first got here? And, you know, at that time, we had a really prolific score and player in Camille Zimmerman, but the rest of our pieces, you know, we still had to build around – so we kind of just gave her the ball and like, you know, gave it to her in the high post. We're like, go ahead, go to work, kid, you know? So, um, but then we were able to bring in the players that we were hoping to, to play fast. And, you know, nobody else in our league plays as fast as us. So that was something that was important. I wanted to be different. I was like, I want to be different. And I also want to play a style that's extremely fun to recruit to. And players, you know, every player says they want to play fast, right? Whether or not they can, that's the other part. <laughs> so, um, so then when we started recruiting towards that, we realized, you know, we didn't always have to be like the tallest team or the biggest team, but we needed to be extremely fit, focused, um, and long and versatile in terms of size as well. So, you know, now we don't, we, don't, we kind of have a lot of players from that like 5'10 to 6'2 range mm -hmm. that can do, um, you know, multiple things, right? Play between positions. And you also do not sacrifice, and I think this is just an important part of it and, and part of the thinking in my mind where I'm saying, you know, okay, so how do you go about doing it? all that makes sense, but you guys do not sacrifice uh, on the offensive or the defensive boards either. You know, you are uh, top 100 and, and by some measures I is 14th uh, on the defensive boards. And so, you know, does that come down to an effort intensity question as much as anything else? Because, you know, that seems less strategic. Uh, you know, we were just uh, talking to Vic Schaefer, um, who has Rory Harmon as a sophomore. She's five, six and she's, mm -hmm. 0.6% defensive rebound percentage. And so I just wonder, you know, whether that is less something that you can implement systematically and more a question of who are the players and how much are they giving you on any given night? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a personnel thing. I think it's a mentality as well, right? Like we talk a lot about like, you know, we have a, we have a term and a glossary for everything. Like, you know, um, we talk a lot about getting your sandwich grabbers out, right? So with 50-50 balls and um, our players like buy into that. It's something we celebrate. We also celebrate getting three stops in a row. We call those, you know, turkeys in our program. So 
Um, we have like a language and we make it fun for them too. You know, this isn't just about like, go get the ball. Like, yeah, of course it is, but they have to like buy into it, feel it, um, be able to like coach it within each other, um, and, and have fun with it. You know, that's the bottom line. So yes, it's a mentality. I do think you can teach it, but like, that's a big part of how we recruit too, is like people that can end up with the ball. So locked on women's basketball is brought to you by prize pitch. Prize pitch gives you the opportunity to test your own knowledge against yourself. Pick two to five players, and if they go on to score more or less than their prize pitch projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. It's not competing against other people. It's you versus the projection. Prize pitch offers projections on any sport you watch, everything from women's college basketball to the WNBA to National Women's Soccer League, NBA, NFL, MLB, you name it. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. So, Download the Price Pitch app or go to prizepitch.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. We've got an offer for you. 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code LOCKEDON. If you deposit $100, Price Pitch gives you $100. $50, they give you $50. Use code LOCKEDON, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, for that instant deposit match up to $100. Price Picks. When we think about the particulars of who's ending up with the ball, and obviously Abby Sue is who we really need to start with. <laughs> Abby does so many different things. Again, we go back to the versatility. Uh, she's able to find her teammates. She's getting into passing lanes on a regular basis. Uh, you know, be, has become a knockdown shooter from three, and and really is your primary floor stretcher as far as that goes. Is there kind of a next step for Abby when you think about what you need? out of her this year? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think for her, there's a, there's a much needed desire to be like a complete two way player. You know, I I think Abby does a nice job on the perimeter defensively, but the minute like she messes something up or she screws up a a coverage, she, she kind of stalls a little bit. And so that's something we talk a lot about is like, you got to keep playing. And Mm so you're going to see a dramatic shift in the player that she's been the last two seasons to the player that she will start becoming. Because even on the offensive side of the ball, I'm like, you pass the ball. It's like watching Steph Curry. The minute he passes it is when he gets open because that's when the defender falls asleep. Right. So we're just trying to help her understand um, how she needs to play the game with the skill set that she has. And I mean, she could literally run all day. So it's like a player like that. Um, really being locked into both sides and understanding like you can always make up for something, just keep moving forward, keep playing, keep playing. So um, I'm excited to see her do that this year. Is, is the hope when you kind of think about point distribution that she is not by far your primary floor stretcher. I think I, I'm not sure you had somebody who was at three, three attempts per game last year. And I know she was up around nine. Um, I think you were at like 31, three um, in terms of, accuracy you have folks who you know you can see it they can shoot you can see that there's potential for jumping that forward do you think we will see more of that this year from you guys definitely definitely you know our goal is you know we want to we want to get up at least 33s a game you know that's something that's that's been important to us Um, and you know abby's going to get her shots up you know i always say an open catch and shoot three abby shoe you know, it's a 75% shooter. Like that's like her freshman year. She shot 75% on catch and shoot threes, but guess what? She doesn't get a lot of those anymore. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> um, you know, so for players like Kitty Henderson, Carly Rivera, Jada Patrick, Caitlin Davis, Hannah Pratt, you know, Paige Lauder, you go down the line, all of them are comfortable shooting the three. Now it's a matter of mentality, right. And making that mental switch to take the shot when you have it. So, you know, it's just a rewiring a little bit, but something mm-hmm. they've been working on and, you know, I know they're hungry to do it and showcase that. Let's talk about Caitlin, obviously, because so much of what you do involves her. And, and, you know, for me, you know, when I think back to last year, and there are obviously so many moments, but the performance she put together, and not that it was out of character, but it was given the moment, given the place she was to do what she did. I mean, 21 points. I mean, she filled up the stat sheet against Boston College for you guys to come back the way you did in that spot. Did that feel to you like you were reaching another level in what you saw out of Caitlin Davis? Absolutely. Um, she is one of the most exciting basketball players that, you know, I've, I've ever had a chance to coach. Um, and there's been some pretty elite company in that. Uh, she, it, there's an instinctual part to her game that you can't teach, right? Like she just has such a knack for what to do. Now, the big thing for her is, 
you know, it's not overthinking, right? So we're trying to help her understand the game plan, execute, and then play freely. Um, and that's something that I feel like towards the end of last year, she was doing very masterfully, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the next part is for her defensively, you know, using your instincts, but also understanding when not to try to make a play. Sometimes she tries to make plays too much and gets herself in trouble. And then she's sitting on the bench with me. Right. So those are, those are some of the growth steps that she needs to take um, as a floor leader for us. Um, but, you know, this is also like her third year of college basketball, which is crazy. You know, yeah. um, we didn't play two years ago and then she barely played her senior year of high school. So the game is still very new to her. And for such a creative mind, I think you're going to see her really unleash this year all of her potential. Speaking of unleashing, it is easy if you look at the season stats to overlook what Jada Patrick became for you guys by the tail end of that season. It was just absolutely critical. I know there was a lot of buzz around her coming from Duke, coming to you guys. Um, you know, she was obviously a huge part of your overseas trip this summer. I, you know, I know legend in points on several occasions, but what, for those of us who haven't seen her in person uh, in quite some time, what are we going to see out of Jada Patrick coming up this year for you guys? Yeah, I think, you know, Jada is a special talent. I mean, she is a special athlete, but she's also extremely smart, too. Um, like, you know, she's a very she's a pretty coachable kid, too. Um, she responds well. She handles adversity well. And it's just a matter of her staying out of her own way that way. Right. Kids can be hard on themselves. And she handles adversity well when we're coaching her up and everything. But sometimes, you know, it's like staying external so that you don't get those negative thoughts about, oh, I just messed this up or what was I supposed to do or you know, players make mistakes. And that's something like, you know, her and Caitlin, especially like we're trying to help them understand, like, it's just about continuing with the play. What is next? The game is fluid, right? Um, it's not about per playing a perfect game, but playing the game the right way. So, you know, for somebody like her, I mean, she's just got tons of potential. Um, and, you know, I think you're going to see a locked in version of Jada much earlier this year. Um, you know, she had to get her feet wet last season. It's hard to transfer as a junior, especially when you didn't have a lot of experience in the COVID year, right? Really, really was difficult. Duke did not play that season. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for her, this is really her like second full season of playing and playing a major role. So excited for her. Um, and sky is the limit with that one. That's for sure. Coming out of Saddle River Day High School right here in Burden County. So we're uh, glad, glad to see her uh, taking those next steps forward. Um, you also have uh, a couple of young players who are coming in and it's hard to break into a rotation when you have so many established players, I know, but take me through your freshman class and, and how much we can expect them to play. You know, uh, both of them, uh, Susie Raphael and Perry Page, they, they seem to be right in keeping with what you talked about, you know, right in that range of five, 10 to six, two, right in that ability to do a bunch of different things. Are they, are they, are they part of the rotation from day one? Yes, I think they will be. Um, another one fun fact about uh, our program at Columbia is that our freshmen play, right? So every year I take, and our staff takes tremendous pride in recruiting players that we need and not just players that we have. So mm -hmm. those are two players we've targeted very early stage. We were very fortunate to get two players that were very high priorities for us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think what you're going to see from both of them is um, a lot of, you know, athleticism, especially mm -hmm. coming out with Perry. I mean, Perry's, um, you know, just she's extremely strong, too, and physical. Um, and just slowing down, learning the game, learning the system is going to be, you know, her biggest adjustment to it, which most college players from their first year are. Um, but her tenacity and her willingness and want to be good um, is really special. And that's something that, you know, she hasn't really missed a, missed a beat, even with all the new things we've been throwing at her. Um, and she fits right in, you know, with our program. So excited to see what she has in store, but you will definitely see them early in the season. Um, and then Susie, we, we call her Suze. Uh, she's just like, I think, you know, a little bit like a deer in headlights at times, but she's got so much natural talent and ability. Um, her length is unreal. I mean, she can affect the game. The minute she steps on the court, she changes the game. It's kind of like having another Caitlin on your team. Wow. Um, and it's now just imagine like harnessing that a little bit for her and helping her understand her role um, and how to be more aggressive in that role. So that's the hardest part for freshmen, right? It's like, don't wait your turn. You know, it's time to step up and, um, we just want to make sure that we build them up to be as confident as possible on the court. 
when I look at your schedule, you know, I, I was joking with Tony Bazella uh, from Seton Hall about the fact that, you know, his team is an honorary member of the Ivy League. They're playing you. <laughs> they're playing Princeton. You guys are effectively, though, playing a Power 5 schedule, right, from the get-go. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. Memphis. You've got Vandy coming, Vanderbilt coming, you know, in week one. Um I'm just wondering when you think about this, and, and this kind of goes back to something I'll bet you feel strongly about as well, but I definitely do. I think the Ivy Dets underseeded in the NCAA tournament. I think the Ivy Dets under-respected. Uh, I thought that you guys were an NCAA team last year, and then I think you went out and proved it with the run that you had in the WNIT. But is it partially when you're making this schedule, are you looking at it with not just what your team is able to handle, but being able to say, all right, look, this is indisputable. We're going to put these wins on the board, and then the selection committee is going to have to respect what we're doing where, when, whenever March rolls around. Most definitely. Um, this is something we talk a lot about in, within our conference when we get together is like we have to schedule better. We just do. And I've been a big proponent of that since day one. I know that's something um, – that I've, I've understood too with the net ranking and how it is, you know, and, and it hasn't quite evolved yet to the level of the, the intricacies of the men's net ranking, right? So there's not all of, there's still like your quads and stuff like that, but the home and away and all that, you just need to, you need to schedule good teams. That's basically what it comes down to it. And they have to be top, at least top hundred teams, you know, and you need to get a top, a top 30 win, right? You need to get, even have a top 30 team on your, pro, on your schedule, right? So for us to be, Hey, we're coming to you, Iowa state and, yeah. yeah, that's all intentional. Um, you know, and two, we got to put these kids on a national stage. Like our team is very fun to watch. And I just felt like there were so few opportunities last year for people to actually watch us unless you were on ESPN plus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just, I'm hoping to expose this, this program and, and our fan base and, and just get more fans to and people excited about what Columbia women's basketball is um, with this schedule. When you talk about people being able to see it, you guys being on ESPN, you, on January the 6th. Let's talk not only about that, and uh, for those of us at the next, we are going to definitely have a playback. We're gonna have a second screen opportunity. We're gonna have staff members at the building. Um, I'm gonna be there as well. <laughs> We're gonna make sure that's gonna be a big one, a yep. big one, and everyone better make sure they're watching. But we should also talk about the fact that Princeton was the kryptonite last year. Yep. We were looking at a, a team, you know, that's a, that was a very good Princeton team, as we saw, as we saw come in the NCAA as well. Um, but how central is it to the discussions you're having with your team? I know, you know, you guys, you mentioned this in media day. You were excited about the chance to get back and play Seton Hall again. But here's mm -hmm. an opportunity to show, you know, what we talked about up top, that this is an Ivy League where Columbia has a chance to be the pace setter. So just take me through kind of the way in which you strike that balance between game at a time. And, you know, man, this has got to be circled in red, I would imagine. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's, I mean, you can't run from the truth, right? Like that's the thing I tell our team. And I'm like, the best part about the rivalry that we're starting to create with Princeton is that it's talked about not just within the two programs, like clearly there's some national recognition and buzz around it. Right. For us to have the linear game last year at home, for them to have it this year at home, you know, like there's just, there's something about people wanting to watch these two teams compete. And, you know, I told our team, like, Princeton will play us harder than everybody else because we have something that they want that, they, well, we want something that they have, yeah. right? So we have to look at it as an opportunity. And honestly, they have everything to lose, right? So for our team, I feel like at certain points, the pressure almost became too big for them last year because, like, we had, they were like, we need to do this, we need to do this. I'm like, no, we don't need to do anything. You know, we get to do this. And we have to stay focused on what we're doing and not let that interfere how they how they're going to come at us interfere with what we're doing. Um, you know, but that team, like that's a very good program. You know, I, got, I was part of the building years of that program. They know what it takes to win, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, like credit to them. You know, they have a lot of talented players. And, you know, I think the big thing for us is our team now know exactly what we need to do. Right. We needed those experiences and um, we'd never been in a postseason. That team has been in. 10 times, 12 times, however many times they've gone, they've been that many more times than us in a postseason with mm. multiple game experiences. So for us to just get this WNIT experience, uh, playing the Ivy League tournament, um, it was invaluable, you know, and it's it's definitely something that will help us, um, I think, really get get over that hump and, and, you know, give us an edge. The ghost of Blake Dietrich's three-point shots, in other words, or <laughs> you guys. I'm channeling that, you know, I'm channeling Blake's energy, uh, 
Her Blake is one of the most special players I've, I was ever able to coach because of her killer instinct. She had something I have not seen in a lot of players' eyes, and she still has it today. I mean, but oh yeah, that's that's something that lives. <laughs> we, should, we should all strive for Blake Dietrich energy in everything we do. I agree with you. I agree. So, bottom line, when you think about this season, and 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 maybe this is an unfair thing to ask, but I just you know, having done so much else here, is anything short of an Ivy League title something where you're going to feel disappointment at the end of the year? I mean, Howard, when I lose a game, I'm disappointed. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, you know, I'm one thing I've learned about myself. I mean, I know this. I'm a terrible loser. Like, I'm <laughs> such a bad loser. Um, and our kids know that. But that's something I'm really, I've been working on to be like, you know, like, let's make sure we're using all these lessons for a good thing. Now, you know, with our program, they know exactly what's at stake, you know, and they have done so much to take this program and completely flip it on its head. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to remind everybody about enjoying every day. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, so there are no failures, there are no, you know, you're gonna have setbacks. But, you know, one of my favorite quotes um, said by Pat Summit is handle adversity, handle failure as you handle success. And that's something that I'm constantly reminding myself of. I'm constantly reminding our team of. So I don't feel like there will be setbacks. It's just going to look different. This year is a new year. Um, I'm trying to keep that mindset. Well, I, I, I've never met a champion who's particularly comfortable with losing. So that certainly dovetails. And uh, I am very excited how frequently and how immersively we plan to continue to tell the story of Columbia basketball. Um, and really, congratulations to all your building. Cannot wait. Um, to be seeing you guys in person up close soon. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for being with us as always. Again, we are here every day. This is what we do. And we love every second of it, as you can probably tell. So make sure you are continuing to make us your first listen every day. Make sure you're over at the nexttubes.com to see all our incredible young writers and the talent that they are bringing to covering this game. Um, and uh, coach, thank you for your time as always. Yeah, thanks, Howard. I second everything you just said. I think you guys do a phenomenal job covering the game, and I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. We'll be talking to you again, and we'll be seeing you tomorrow here at Lockdown Women's Basketball. I'm Howard Magdal, wishing you a wonderful day. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. <laughs>